Hi folks, this is Jay. I hope you're okay today. We're do, doing some uh, theology and theological reflection uh, today, and I uh, hope you're okay. And we're looking at Irenaeus and the four Gospels. Uh, we're going to consider these various conspiracy theories that have come up against the authorship of the four Gospels. And I'm going to give you some uh, cutting edge scholarship and research that I've done myself. That, can, uh, that just absolutely demolishes uh, any of these conspiracy theories about the gospel. So let's come before the Lord. Lord, we thank you for your love and your grace, and we give you the praise, and we give you the glory today. We thank you for all your goodness uh, and all your love. And Father, we pray that these videos would be a blessing to those who will listen in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. So, Basically, uh, I'm just going to talk about who is Irenaeus. Um, I'm using a history of Christian doctrine by uh, J.P. Fisher, uh, by T.N.T. Clark. It was written in uh, 1908. So, um, uh, and this is what uh, Fisher says. Irenaeus was born in Asia Minor, with the tradition in the churches there he is familiar. His type of thought is not without trace of the Jonine teaching, the influence of which prevailed in the region where he spent his youth. His, in his appreciation of the truth of redemption through the incarnate Christ, the truth to which he has given the central place in his system, he rises above the point of view of the Greek apologist. Nevertheless, in his writings, Clement, akin to the more rationalizing apprehensions of Christian doctrine, mingled here and there with more positive and profound interpretations of the gospel. And side by side with the view which are incongruous in the tendency admits the chalistic tradition in eschatology. The antagonist of Gnostic speculation, Irenaeus, in the cast of his mind is intensely practical. We are not to swear from the plenching of scripture and from the rule of faith which embodies it in outline. So that's a little bit about um, Irenaeus from uh, Fisher's history uh, I think he he got a few things that were in inaccurate really um, Irenaeus isn't just practical he is also supremely a genius in theology I've never read anybody in the history of theology and to be honest I've come ac I've never ever read anybody in Christian theology who is as brilliant as Irenaeus and that's saying something uh, people like uh, John Calvin, uh, Luther, and some of these uh, great theologians, um, Thomas Aquinas, were absolutely brilliant. But uh, Irenaeus is not given the credit that he deserves. He was an absolute brilliant thinker, uh, shared uh, in his history of dogmatics, or history of theology, uh, gives a quote and saying that in any age, uh, Irenaeus and Tertullian and another theologian of, of that time uh, are of equal any age uh, so Irenaeus has not got the credit that he deserves he is a brilliant thinker and um, these modern scholars that say that Irenaeus didn't know what the Gnostics were all about to be honest they haven't got a clue they really really haven't got a clue so I'm just reading a few quotes from Michael Haken uh, the Defense of the Truth, published by Evangelical Press. Uh, page 31, he says, Irenaeus of Lyons, 130 to 200, is the most important Greek-speaking Christian theologian of the second century. The noted early church historian J.N.D. Kelly, for example, has observed that Irenaeus' vision of the Godhead is the most complete, the most trinitarian of all the authors of second century except Latin speaking North African Tertullian. Uh, Irenaeus was born in the Roman province of Asia, now in the western coast of modern Turkey. Between 130 and 140, he seems to have grown up in Smyrna, Smyrna, uh, where he came to know Polycarp and died 150, who died 155 AD. The leading elder in the church of that city and a man widely revered for his orthodoxy and piety. According to Irenaeus, Polycarp would tell of his conversation with John and with others who had seen the Lord. In fact, Irenaeus was mentioned by Polycarp, for in a postscript to the account of Polycarp's martyrdom, Irenaeus is described a disciple of Polycarp. 
Uh, we read, now Polycarp was uh, a disciple of John, and Irenaeus was, as a young child, his parents handed him over to Polycarp for education. So Irenaeus was trained, basically, in the apostolic tradition. If anybody, if you wanted to know from anybody what the apostles believed, then you could not have done better than to talk to Irenaeus. He writes uh, in uh, a Eusebius extract, um, about his time as a young boy. I remember events from those days more clearly than those that happened recently. What we learn in childhood adheres to the mind and grows with it, so that I can even picture the place where the blessed Polycarp sat and conversed, his coming and goings, his character, his personal appearance, his discourse to the crowd, and how he reported his discussions with John and others he had seen the Lord. He recalled the very words, what they reported about the Lord and his miracles and his teachings, things that Polycarp had heard directly from eyewitnesses of the word of life and report all harmony with scripture. I listened eagerly to these things at the time and though God, through God's mercy noted them not on paper but in my heart, by God's grace I continue to continually reflect on them." End of quote. So Irenaeus was basically trained in the apostolic tradition from Polycarp who knew John. Now here's the point now that we're going to get on to. Here's some cutting egg scholarship that uh, I've done recently. And uh, this scholarship that I've done clearly demonstrates that the Gospels, uh, four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, were authoritative. Uh, above any other Gnostic Gospels and therefore put them into the first century uh, as historical information about Jesus Christ. And um, the reason we get that is from Irenaeus. Now Irenaeus wrote a book called Against the Heresies. In that book he basically critiques the Gnostics in the first book. He gives a systematic exposition and critique of what the variety of Gnostics believe from Marcion to and to others. And then through it, through the rest of the book he basically um, he basically gave uh, an expose of what the Christian faith was all about. Now, now this is what he says about the Gnostics because they outwardly is a quote from Against the Heresies because they outwardly are covered with sheep's clothing against whom the Lord has joined and joined Matthew 7 14, 15 us to be on our guard and because their language resembles now notice that right at the beginning of the book he quotes Matthew chapter 7 verse 15 now when you read the book of heresies what you find is quote after quote after quote after quote after quote from all four Gospels. Quote after quote after quote. Now that is absolutely, from any historical perspective, that is a grand proof that the four Gospels were seen authoritative in the time of the early church in, in that second century. And that means if they were seen as authoritative in the second century, it means that there was a longer tradition concerning them which pushes the authorship of those Gospels into the first century. Now what I find interesting uh, this accusation that Irenaeus didn't understand the Gnostics properly uh, just to nail this on its head uh, you only have to read his words after reading some of the commentaries as they call them of the disciples of Ven uh, Valentius and after making myself acquainted with the tenants through personal intercourse with some of them. So obviously, Irenaeus has studied the Gnostics. He knew exactly what they were all about. Again, he says, For there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed, nor secret that not be known. Matthew chapter 10, verse 26. Again, he's using the New Testament. He's using the Gospels to defend against the Gnostics. So Irenaeus goes on to describe the uh, the Gnostics. 
Now, what I find interesting on a number of occasions, and this is very, very interesting indeed, on a number of occasions, we get these comments by Irenaeus, and this is devastating to anybody who comes up with any conspiracy theories about the Gospels and the Gnostic Gospel. This is absolutely devastating to this kind of conspiracy theory ideas. Here's Irenaeus. He says, quote, they maintain also that these 30 eons are most plainly indicated in the parable Matthew chapter 20, 1, 16 of the laborers sent into the vineyard. Did you get that? That is pretty significant. It's pretty significant. It's, it's devastating to the Bart Ehrmans of this world. Did you hear what he just said? I'll, I'll quote it again. He's talking about the Gnostics. This is in the first book of Against His Heresies. In chapter one, uh, just uh, round about chapter one, book one, he writes, They maintain, quote, also that, that these 30 eons are mostly indicated in the parable Matthew 20, verse 1 to 16, of the laborers sent into the vineyard. End of quote. What is significant there is Irenaeus is describing these variety, esoteric group of Gnostic sects that we're actually quoting the Gospels. I'm just giving you one example here of Matthew chapter 20 verse 1 to 16, but they were actually quoting the Gospels, the four Gospels, to build a case for the Gnosticism, the various types of Gnosticism. Again, that is another brute fact that you can read the Book of Heresies by Irenaeus and see how he quotes the Gnostics as using the four Gospels. They are actually using the four Gospels to prove what they are saying to also build and produce new Gospels. But it's based on the four Gospels. And if you read against the heresy, you'll see on a number of occasions how Irenaeus shows that that the Gnostics were actually quoting from the four Gospels. We just mentioned Matthew chapter 20, verse 116, but you could go on and on. Again, uh, quote, The production again, again of the Dudecad of the Eons is indicated by the fact that the Lord was 12, Luke 2, 4, 42 years of age when he disputed with the teachers of the law, and by the election of the apostles of these there were 12, Luke 6, 13, the other eight eons are made manifest in this way that the Lord, according to them, conversed with his disciples for 18 months after his resurrection of the dead. End of quote. They moreover affirm that the Saviour is shown to be de de derived from all the eons to be in himself by the following passage, every male that opens the womb, Exodus 3, 2, Luke chapter 2, 23, of he being everything open to the womb of the enthemesis of the suffering eon when it had been expelled from the plumora. This they also styled the second Ogdod, of which we shall speak presently, and they state that it was clearly on this account that Paul said, and he himself is also things, Colossians 3.11, and again all things are to him, and of him are all things, Romans 11.36, and further in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, Colossians 2.9. And yet again, all things are gathered together by God in Christ, Ephesians 1.10. Thus they interpret these and like passages to be found in Scripture. Now that's one, that's one, two, three, four references of Paul's epistles. A reference to Exodus, a reference to, to Luke. Uh, and three references to Luke. Luke chapter 2.23, Luke chapter 6 verse 13, Luke chapter 2.42. So RNS is not in that these Gnostic groups are using um, the scriptures. They're using the Old Testament and they're using the New Testament. Excuse me. They're using, uh, which I want to focus your attention here, They quote, he quotes them using the Gospel of Luke three times here. So we've seen Matthew, we've seen Luke, and it goes on and on and on. So it's very, very clear, absolutely clear, absolutely clear without a shadow of a doubt that the even the Gnostics saw the four Gospels as 
authoritative. So that puts it would beyond any shadow of a doubt, any shadow of a doubt, that the four Gospels were authoritative. And um, if they were authoritative in the second century, it means there was an earlier tradition, without a shadow of a doubt, that goes to the first century. Uh, we can take that. We we can take that on authority because um, Irenaeus mentions he knew Polycarp and Polycarp uh, knew John and Irenaeus knows where the Gospels came from and he mentions who they were written by and etc. And so we can take that on trust that this is accurate and seeing that the early church fathers in the second century quote the Gospels over nineteen thousand times shows you that they were authoritative. I mean the evidence just gets more staggering and absolutely incredible as we go on. Again he quotes uh, the Gnostics and their interpretation he says they maintain further that the girl of 12 years old, the daughter of the ruler of the sinner, Luke 8.41, to whom the Lord appeared and raised from the dead was a type of Achamoth to which the Christ by extending himself. Again he notes the Gnostics quoting a gospel. He goes, thus when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, Matthew 27, 46, he simply showed that Sophia was deserted by the light. Again, it go, he goes on and on and shows how these Gnostic, gospel, Gnostic writers were quoting uh, the gospels. We read, uh, they quoted John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 with the Eon kind of Gnostic theology. Now, what I find interesting with the Gnostics that he describes uh, is they're not interested in, in historical reliability. Um, Irenaeus notes that these Gnostics would take ancient text of writers um, from uh, various philosophers and mash them together without any uh, recourse to the actual um, context of what was being written, which is a marked contrast to the early church, which was deeply interested in his historical information and facts. That's just a difference between the Gnostics and um, He writes, these Gnostics had fantastic ideas, very sophisticated and suited to pull the wool over people's eyes. And so I could go on and on and on. Um, I've just got stack and stacks of notes here that I could just go on and on and on and reading them to you. But I don't want to bore you ad, ad nauseum with with this. I, I think what was interesting as well. Um, quote: uh, Irenaeus says about Polycarp, but Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ but was also by apostles in Asia appointed bishop of the church in Smyrena whom I also saw in my early youth for he tarried on earth a very long time and when a very old man gloriously and most nobly suffering martyrdom to departed this life. What I find very interesting there uh, which I, th I find very significant and very very important is this is that Irenaeus is arguing is absolutely brilliant. He's basically saying, look, you've got all these competing gospels and ideas from all these uh, Gnostics, but we can trace the bishops that come from the apostles. And this is a death knell to all the conspiracy theories of all where the gospels came, because the church can trace its lineage of where and how these gospels were entrusted to the commun Christian community. Where the heretics can't do that, where these Gnostics can't do that, because they're not part of the original apostolic message. He writes this about um,
Wherefore also Mark, quote, Wherefore also Mark, the interpreter and follower of Peter, does thus commence his gospel narrative, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. So he's saying there that Mark was, writ was written by Mark and was an interpreter of Peter. Again, I think this is very clear, solid historical information that he, he writes, John, however, does himself put this matter beyond all controversy on our part when he says he was in the world and the world was made by him. Again, he attributes the authorship of the Gospel of John to the uh, Apostle John. So all this information, and like I said, I have notes and notes of clearly, clearly show the fact that Irenaeus is quoting these Gospels relentlessly in the debate and dialogue with the Gnostics. The fact that the Gnostics are quoting the Gospels and also the fact that Irenaeus is from the Polycarp tradition where Polycarp knew John puts you in a very strong historical position to say that the four Gospels were indeed authoritative in the first in the second century and come from the first century and come from the Apostles whether it be eyewitness or whether it be those followers who acted on behalf of the apostles. Uh, this historical information is absolutely clear, solid, based and uh, completely demolishes any uh, theories or conspiracy theories about the Gospels. And all I can say to you is read the ancient text, read Irenaeus for yourself. So Irenaeus vindicates Christian orthodoxy that the four Gospels were authoritative in the first century and you can trust that the Gospels you have today are the Gospels that were written in the time of the Apostles and have been preserved through the Apostolic Church, the Church that has been faithful to the Apostolic teaching. Thank you for listening and God bless you.